Well, I'll start off by saying that uh, thank you very much for having me. My email is sethdavidgoldstein at gmail.com. But the franchise space is a big industry, and it is an industry, and everybody has to recognize that. So there are uh, industry professionals that you can go to, people like Stuart. Uh, there are accountants that specialize in franchising. There are lawyers, architects, contractors. There's all kinds of learning available online about franchise businesses. There are specialty insurance brokers. There are organizations you can join. There's FranNet, there's Fran Data. Uh, franchise companies uh, get a sort of a, uh, get lumped in with big companies. So someone might think of Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks in the same breath. But Starbucks is a big company and Dunkin' Donuts is a, a group of small companies cobbled together. And one is a franchise and one is not. And so Dunkin' Donuts is a group of small businesses and Starbucks is a big multinational company. They, they both in some way are big companies, but Dunkin' is made up of small business people, people that have gone through a lot to get to where they are so you know it's a big a big commitment to become a franchisee when you sign a franchise agreement you do sign away a lot of your rights to do independent things you're buying into a program you're buying into a system you're buying into an operating system and a way of doing business uh, you're also looking at buying into a culture that you have to try to get along with. So there are a lot of franchisees that uh, try to fight. They're constantly bucking heads with their franchise systems. Uh, that's not the way to do it. Uh, it's really a, uh, it, it's a symbiotic relationship. Uh, even though the franchise system may want one thing, the franchisee may want another, and they, they kind of meet in the middle somewhere. Everybody's got to have a win. Uh, when, you, when you sign a franchise agreement, you commit to perform. So you commit to uh, be a franchisee in good standing, uh, meet certain parameters, meet certain performance metrics, and work the business. Usually in a franchise agreement has a level of commitment that you need to reach, you know, an hourly kind of commitment that you need to reach. And uh, the franchise agreement cannot usually be negotiated. Some of the smaller franchise companies will allow you to negotiate a little bit. And we have been able to wiggle a little bit around a few things, but it's very, very light. And some of it is not written down. Some of it is just, okay, we agree. You'll be able to do that. Don't worry about it. And you kind of have to take them for their word. When you're looking for a franchise, when you're shopping for a franchise, you can have a lot of fun. Uh, you have no money on the line. You're just taking time. You're looking around, you're meeting new people. It's an interesting industry. Uh, everybody's having a good time. Uh, nobody's gonna tell you things are bad until you start to talk to the franchisees. Once you talk to the franchisees, you peel back a little bit of what's going on under the surface. So. When you're, when you're looking, you really have to talk to franchisees that are that the company defines as their top performers, and you want to talk to franchisees that are their bottom performers. And you want to kind of decide whether the bottom performers are bottom performers because of themselves or because of the company. So you really have to kind of decide where you're at. When we were looking, we're Jersey Mike's franchisees now. And when we were looking at that, we decided to look at the paperwork first and see if we can get a franchisee that'll share that paperwork with us. So we were able to see that the paperwork looked good. Uh, it was an interesting model. It didn't require a ton of capital. And uh, we were able to talk to the franchisees about what the growth progression had been. We were also able to look at the company and see what the culture was of the company. So we were able to see that they were a charitable organization. They, they were very community-based. 
they w didn't exist on Long Island at that point. So that kind of made us a little bit nervous. Uh, but they were also in a place where they had just about enough stores to get on TV for about, you know, advertising money to get on TV for, let's say, 30 to 35 weeks a year. And that's really important, whether they do it or not. Uh, for us, you know, because we were mature franchisees at that point, you know, we wanted a business that was at a jump off point. We didn't want a business that was in its infancy. So when you're looking at franchise businesses, there are franchise businesses that have a thousand stores and there are franchise businesses that have 20 and there are store companies that have 10,000. So when you're looking at one that has 20, you're really taking a, a, a leap that they're going to get past 100. And as Stuart will tell you, 100 is a magic number for franchise businesses. Once you get to 100, you start to really mature and get to a place where the franchise can exist. You know, you got some, you got some uh, revenue behind you and uh, it becomes very interesting. The, the franchise company with 20 stores is barely making money themselves. Uh, it's expensive to start a franchise company. It's costly. It's not cheap. It's also expensive to become a franchisee. It's not cheap. It's some people think that, hey, the franchise company gives you all these things, but you pay for them. You know, uh, if I was opening Seth's Deli, I wouldn't have an 11% uh, royalty on my sales. I wouldn't have an operating manual I have to stick to. I could sell what I want. I could do different things. I could buy things where I want. You know, so when you, when you talk about a franchise business, it's a business that uh, usually uh, when, when a franchise business has some maturity to it, it's got a real good level of success rate. So you can see that other franchisees are being successful. Some are being more successful than others. And you can, you can look at what's going on in the business. Um, researching the franchise is really important. You know, you really got to get fr other franchisees to open up to you. You've got to get them to give you paperwork. Inside a franchise agreement, you'll read lots of things. Any good attorney that reads a franchise agreement will tell you not to sign it. Uh, except you have to sign it. So you have to take that leap of faith. When you sign that, you give up pretty much every right you could ever think of. But the most powerful uh, tool that a franchisee has is their relationship with the company. So if you have a great relationship with the company, they don't want you to be unhappy. They want you to be successful because success breeds success. So uh, while you do give up lots of rights, Inside the franchise agreement, there's lots of things you can question and say, how does this work? How does this happen? How does this happen? How do you support me? How do you support the other franchises? There's also something in there called item 19. And item 19 in the franchise agreement gives you some financial information. It's the simplest of, fran of financial information. What you really want is a P&L from an existing franchisee so that somebody can tell you what's really going on. Because no matter what you ever look at in item 19 and what kind of textbook things you do to figure out whether a franchise is good or not, you're really just not gonna, you're gonna miss some of the nuances that go on in between the lines on a p &L. So you really need to really get somebody's existing p &L. You may have to take them out to dinner. You may have to buy them a drink. You may have to bother them until they break down, but you'll get it eventually. There's lots of people. Franchise business is a pretty open business. Uh, the great part about it is that other franchisees near me, if they're successful, that breeds success in my business. I don't know what Jersey Mike Stewart went to this morning or this past uh, last week, but I know that if he had a good experience at one, he's going to potentially will come to mind. And that's good for me. So franchise businesses, unlike other businesses, we want everyone to make money. We want everybody to do well. Tell you a little bit about my background. 
now that I've kind of laid the groundwork on franchising. I started as a kid working in a Baskin Robbins store. When I graduated college, I was able to buy in to a small piece of it. Uh, the franchise business is really, I think, the only business left other than maybe apprenticeships with carpentry and electrical and things like that, where you can start as a porter in a store and one day own a business and one day own multiple businesses. It's really the experience that you uh, trade on. So if you have experience in some franchise business, if you worked at McDonald's and you wanna own a McDonald's one day, which McDonald's is a small business, but it's also a big corporate business too. But um, if you wanted to own a place and you worked at a Jersey Mike's and you wanted to own one, you go to a bank and you say to the bank, do you lend to franchises? And you say, I have experience. And they say, well, what kind of experience do you have? I worked there for five years. I've been a successful general manager. I've helped open stores. I've helped do this. Now I want to buy my own store. And the business is filled with people like that. The, I have a friend who has schools named after him. He started as a porter in the stores. And, uh, you know, it's just like that all the time. Yeah. The, the, my background, like I said, is working part-time, becoming an owner. We had 13 Baskin stores in three states, and they were uh, mostly in malls. When that business changed, we went to work with Duncan, which is, was a sister company. Uh, so we started with Duncan. We didn't have the capital for that, but the brand saw us as great Baskin operators. So they get, they guaranteed our loans to come from Baskin to Duncan. So we were really the first franchisees to come from Baskin to Duncan. It's a quantum change in uh, financials. So it's a very difficult jump to make. Uh, so you go from a business that can be open maybe uh, requirement, maybe $150,000 at that time to get started to a business that might require a million dollar uh, valuation, you know, a million dollar net worth to get started in. So it, it became a very difficult uh, transition financially for us, but the brand backed us. And I, I can't thank them enough for that because it changed all of our lives. Uh, what happened was we uh, ended up being in Duncan for, uh, we were in Baskin for ever. And uh, we ended up selling some of those stores in the malls. And as the mall business changed, we closed a few, sold a few. Some of them, uh, one or two are still open. Uh, we sold them off. That was in the 80s. Uh, in, the, in the 90s, we got involved in Duncan. And we ended up with 16 Dunkin' Donuts stores, all, all in Suffolk County. And we ended up selling those to a private equity firm in 2015. That private equity firm has 150 stores now and is the largest franchisee of any type in New York State and is one of the top 10 franchisees in the country. Uh, you know, they hold more franchises than anybody else. So it's a conglomerate. That's not an individual, obviously. It's a conglomerate that actually owns a ton of stores. And they started as individuals. And they became so big that they brought on investors and got bigger. And they, have, uh, they were able to take our stores, our 16 stores, and add on 10 or 12 in our area which financially they were capable of doing, and we were not. But, uh, well, I would have added a few, but I wouldn't have added 10 or 12, you know. So uh, they were able to grow the business further, you know. So there became a point where, you know, it, it, it just, it was more valuable to them than it was to me. So uh, it was very nice to be able to exit that. Uh, I will say after doing it for a lifetime, it is like exiting, uh, teaching or the police force. It's like leaving a fraternity, uh, but it was very difficult to do. And during that time, uh, when I was with Duncan for 10 years, I was elected to their uh, 
chair their advertising committee, which is a big committee. Uh, you know, the budget for advertising there is gigantic. Um, it's uh, the budget of a country. <laughs> and, uh, and people are very nice to you when you control that kind of funding. But uh, you find out very quickly who your friends are when you sell. But uh, to be elected by a group of stores that are in the thousands is a great honor. And it's, it's a lot of uh, responsibility. And you get to see the business from both sides. So like I said, you know, it needs to be a win for the company. It needs to be a win for you. It needs to be, a, everyone has to win. You have to figure out franchisees and franchisors how everybody gets along and how everybody will make money and grow the business. The business growing is the most important thing. Business growing individually, business growing uh, outside of the stores. Um, the Currently, I'm a, a Jersey Mike's franchisee and I kind of told you how I got there. We have six operating stores currently, uh, one across from the train station by the Stony Brook by the university and the new shopping center. That store uh, is our slowest store, but it is uh, increasing in sales by uh, double digits every year. So we know it'll get there, but you know, you have to be committed to keep working it. Um, we have a seventh about to open in uh, Hop Hog on Motor Parkway. It will open in the next 30 days. And we have an eighth that's been under construction for three years and will probably be under construction for a fourth. So uh, Long, is Island, Long Island is a tough place to do business uh, if you're brick and mortar. Uh, it's probably it's a tough place to do business regardless. But uh, I will tell you that it's very interesting. Every store we open, and I've probably built 30 or 40 stores on Long Island uh, over the course of my career. And uh, there's always something new that comes up that is a new regulation or requirement that one inspector likes and the other doesn't. The interesting thing about regulations is they're up to interpretation and that is always uh, a crapshoot, you know, so you gotta really decide how it's gonna go. Um, even the Stony Brook store, when we opened it, we were completely finished. We had hired the crew, we had booked the advertising and the fire marshal said, you need this item. And we said, okay, we'll do it, no problem. And we'll do it right away. And he said, okay, I'll come back in three weeks. So now I have a crew that I'm paying. I have a rent that I'm paying. I have advertising that goes to waste. I can't open until I finish that. I don't know, it seems to happen all the time. This uh, is an interesting place, Long Island. So uh, we also have two Sola salons. Uh, Sola Salon is a franchise that is a WeWorks for stylists and hairstylists and estheticians. It's a it's really a franchise for very uh, mature franchisees, franchisees that have been around the block. It's uh, very capital intensive. It's very hard to uh, get into, and it is uh, very uh, strange in a way because you have no employees but you also have there's no busy day you're renting space so it's a steady thing you have to keep stylists happy uh they do now go into their own business so you got to convince a stylist to leave their salon and where they may be very successful and come and work in your space now, it's life-changing for them, so that's part of what we do. We do some career coaching to them. They're opening their first business, and they're coming to work. They become independent business people when they take space in our space. So we have one in Plainview. It has 31, it has 31 rooms, suites, we call them, uh, different sizes. We have 28 of them rented. So we are a success in that respect. Uh, it's really a, an arbitrage between what we spend on financing and what we spend on rent to what we collect. And when a stylist works in a regular salon, they usually split their income with a the salon. They work a 50-50 split. So if they're 
bringing in four thousand dollars a week to a salon. Two thousand goes to the salon. Two thousand goes to them. They of course keep their tips, and whether or not they get paid in cash or not, which is the wrong thing to do, uh, they they do whatever they got to do. When they come to us, they might pay us four hundred dollars a week for a room, and they increase their income by let's say sixteen hundred dollars a week. So it's life changing for them. We also have them set up a company so that they're in a business. They can now expense their supplies. They can buy a car with a, with a loan. They can get a mortgage. They're not just sticking cash in their pockets. Um, you know, it's it's interesting, and Stuart may go over a little more of this. A lot of people think you're in a cash business, and in all of these kind of things, and that is just not the case. Mm -mm. Cash business is the worst thing you can be in if you want to grow, if you want equity, if you want to create wealth, if you want to create a good life for yourself. Cash business is really only today. So what you really want to do is be in a business where you're putting the money in the bank, you're reporting your sales, you're doing everything the right way, because then you can go to a bank and say, here's my paperwork. I'm doing a great job. I want to open another one of these in this neighborhood. I think this is a great business. And the bank's going to say, oh, yeah, it looks good. You know, so uh, the person that doesn't do that has a different problem. That was probably so, the best thing you said today. Well, that's that's a learning that even all of us go through at one point. We think it's very good to have full pockets, but it's actually better to have a full bank account. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest mistake I ever made, and this is a good, bad and ugly kind of conversation, is being undercapitalized. Whatever the franchise agreement says, you need a little bit more. And whatever anybody says, you can do this and have your other job, you can't. Uh, somebody's got to be committed full time to it. And uh, I also, I would say the biggest mistake I ever made in the business was trying to impress the company, trying to impress the franchise company with things other than doing a great job. So franchise like company, well, the franchise company might come out with all kinds of new ideas and you can't buy into every one of them. You gotta argue a little, you don't have to argue a lot, but you can't buy everything. So they say, oh, you need this new piece of equipment. You need this new piece of equipment, you need this piece of equipment. So when I had a number of stores at Duncan, you know, and I needed to look at the business and say, what's going on here? I ended up looking at it and saying I had maybe 30 to 50 small little loans for equipment that really on the face of it, in each one, they were little dollars. When you added them all together, they were another store. I mean, they were really expensive at that point. And you get kind of lost in trying to impress the company by buying into everything. Mm -hmm. So that was a problem for me. And uh, always being undercapitalized, like I said, coming from Baskin to Duncan, that was a very difficult thing to do. Um, I could have used a little more money. It would have made life a little more comfortable. Uh, I did have business through 9-11. That was de definitely a difficult time. Business through 2008 a really difficult time, uh, maybe the worst ever. And, uh, you know, of course, through the pandemic, which turned out immediately to be a problem, but at the end of the day, for the business I'm in, it turned out to be a bonus. So, uh, because we are a portable food, we are uh, just, we fit everything that we needed to be. Right, and, do you deliver? Uh, we delivered, we were sealed, we were just in the height of the pandemic. We were, you know, we donated a, a lot of sandwiches to the school and to the tents that were up. And yes. we were able to do that because we had a business that was thriving at that time. And we condensed hours and we made, you know, so it worked out to our advantage, I, I hate to say. But, you know, uh, that's the, the biggest uh, learning that I have in this business is that other people are really important. People that you work with are really important. People that you meet are really important. Doing this is really important. 
meeting people like Stuart, meeting people like Ronnie, meet, meeting everybody here, that is really important. It's important to the business. It's important to the growth of the business. It's important to um, recognize your people that work with you, that they are team members, they're not just employees, that they are, some of them are better than you. <laughs> and you really have to recognize that. Uh, that is really a big learning. Uh, even, uh, even, even so, uh, you need to be able to coach and counsel even the people that are better than you. And you need to find uh, management that can replace you. And you need to find people that can do the job and you can be satisfied with the job they're doing. But if they stick to the operations that you've learned in the franchise, generally speaking, everyone's doing things the same way. And that's very, very helpful. It's easier to manage, but you know, it is, uh, it is important to recognize the value of the people around you. But what I would also say is that you need to have a strong franchise company. So when I say that, it needs to be financially strong, it also needs to have an operation arm that's strong. A lot of the complaints you'll hear from franchisees is that the company comes in and they uh, they do uh, something we call seagull seagull management. Seagull, the bird, the seagull, which uh, flies in, craps on you, and then flies away. So uh, that's not good. <laughs> but you also need a franchise company that comes in. They may crap on you. <laughs> but they need to be able to help you fix things. So you want an operations team that is strong, but also helps you resolve things. So you want- What is one, one way that they come in and crap on you? Well, they might say, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. I'm not letting you uh, open your next store, um, you know, and uh, you're uh, undevelopable until I come back. And then they don't come back for six months. Oh. And then on the sixth month, they come back and you're having a bad day. You have a flood. You have a toilet backup. You have a, something's going on that's bad. And they're only seeing these moments of problem. And that's, that's not good. You need somebody that has a consistent kind of program that they are strong. They come in and they do things. And, and, and the, your neighboring franchisee, if he's not good, you want them to come in there and fix him. Uh, because his reputation is your reputation. You got the same name. So it's really important. You also want them to be financially strong. You want them to be able to advertise. You want them to be able to spend money on things. You want them to be able to think about the future of their business and know where they're going. Um, and I'll just kind of finish with uh, one story that I would consider ugly in this particular case, because that's what we named this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met a group of franchisees that were opening a business, a brick and mortar business, uh, a bakery style business. And they're super nice guys and they're smart and they have uh, a background in computer business and they do, they have jobs uh, or what we call in this industry, real jobs. They have jobs with company and uh, they stuck with their jobs while they opened this business. And I met them and I advised them a little in the beginning. And I said, you know, what are you guys doing with your jobs? And they said, well, we're keeping them. We make a lot of money. We, this is going to be our second business. This is going to be our, you know, we're not, we're not really, this is not our real job. And the second somebody says that I know they're going to fail uh, because they're not committed. So these guys said, no, 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 we're very committed. We've just, we took an extra large store and we're building our home office in the store. And I said, oh my God, that is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Because all that says to your employees, all that says to your franchise company is we are not committed to this business. We are committed to our jobs and we're going to kind of look at this business. So everyone that comes to work for you knows that you don't really care. And in this business, the business that I'm in, the business that we, that I say is a real industry, if you're not 100% committed, everyone knows it. Everyone needs to know that you're available, you come in, you're working the store, you're working the business, you're working 
you talk to the customers, you take the grief, you take the, you go to the bank, you do this, you do that, you work with people, you'll do the same job they do all day long. And I will. And I don't worry about somebody saying to me, hey, if you don't, I'm going to walk out and your day will be ruined. My day won't be ruined. I love what I do. So I'll take the counter any day of the week. But um, I don't have to because I value the people that are with me. They understand that I'm fully committed. They know that I would do that. And uh, But these guys are trying to go out of business. And they can't because the franchise company won't let them. And when you sign a franchise agreement, you commit to perform. So if you close a business that is a franchise, the franchise company could potentially come after you for lost earnings because you didn't perform and they can prove it. And they can prove it in court and they can prove it to you. And they can prove it beyond the shadow of a doubt. And you're going to say, well, this business wasn't that good. I, you know, I couldn't make money out of it. It was just, they didn't support me. They didn't do this. And they will prove that they supported you. And they will prove that they did those things. So uh, really, that's just how I wanted to finish this up. You know, for my portion of this, uh, the, like I said, these guys showed everyone they worked with that they were not committed. And maybe if they were committed, they'd have a successful business. And that's really it. I, I mean, understand all- that. I, it's yeah. funny, when you first told me that they were putting their offices in the back of the in the back of the stores, I thought, that's a brilliant idea. They can just walk up and see what's going on and continue to manage. But if, in reality, that's not not good. That's yeah, a very good. bad idea. <laughs> very bad I, idea. I thought you were going to go after their building they're paying retail rent for office space. I thought you were going to say that's part of it. They built out these beautiful <laughs> that too. in retail space and just throwing money away that, that that should be reinvested into marketing and sales and growing your business. No, it was just paper. really, it really, from day one, they just kept telling everybody that this is not their real job. And that is well, just a terrible place to be. Yeah. That, that, that was, that's, uh, that's ugly. <laughs> yes. But, you know, something that you said also, you know, you can and maybe we'll we'll segue to, to Stuart t- saying his part. But let me just ask you a question or say something that I've noticed is that what you're saying is the franchisors have all the power because, you know, they have to be committed to you as well. Like they want all the commitment to come from the franchisees. You keep saying that. Mm-hmm. But really, they have a big responsibility too to they perform do. their That's- part. And that's right, why right. you that's why you've got to investigate culture. You've got to investigate whether franchisees are satisfied. You've got to talk to the franchisees that are not satisfied. You've got to do the research. So when we were researching Sola, which is a very big commitment financially for myself and my business partners, um, we traveled around the country and spoke with the tenants also that are in There were about 500 of these in the country when we started to look. There's about 600 now of Sola. And Sola is very successful in Suffolk County. We own Nassau County so uh, for development. And uh, we went and spoke to these tenants, and they were all happy. They were all making more money. That's the research we had to do. And I went to different places in the country. We went to all over the from California to New York and spoke to just various tenants and they loved it and they were very happy. And what mm-hmm. the franchise company does for us is it provides an equity base. It provides a model to follow. It provides a community for the people that are uh, renting. So they have a network of, them, of their own. And if they stay, that's the whole business. You yeah, know, you're, you're sort of being a landlord, though. How is it different than being a landlord? Well, because you're actually participating in their business. You're helping them grow their business. You're helping them with their online presence. Right. You're helping them with purchasing. Training. Right. You're helping them become, form a corporation, mm-hmm. become a real mm-hmm. person, oh. have insurance. Okay. Oh, oh, uh, oh. Okay. Hmm. If you deposit the money here, you could expense your car because you have two of these units. You're driving in between. You can 
You know, there's right, so much right, coaching right. that we can do. You need to use an accountant. Okay, interesting. <laughs> you know, uh, all those things. Uh, uh, hairdressers are uh, artists, really, mm-hmm. and so are nail people and things like that. They they treat themselves like artists. Right. And we provide learning for them. We provide new product introduction. We provide insurance for them. I did not know you did all that at back end stuff. I yes. have no idea. But at the end of the day, you could look at it and say, okay, you're just the landlord, but we are both. Uh, because the more we can make you, the tenant, the the stylist happy, the longer you stay. The more and people flock and, and, and also, it. you know, rent. Yeah, I, I make sense. Makes total that's sense. It. Thank you. I yes. love this. I could talk yeah. about this all day. Stuart. Sure. Stuart Levenberg. I'm with the Kensington Company. I'm here 20 plus years. We're business brokers. We're franchise consultants. We help people buy businesses. I want to be your tour guide. If you're looking to buy a business, you don't know what's right for you. You have questions. You're trying to fight, find the right industry, the right brand, the right product. That That is what our company does. It's why we're able to work with the SBDC and these other organizations, because I'm not here to try and sell you anything. And my whole approach, and I know Seth and Ronnie and everybody, it's why we're invited. We believe in the good, the bad, the ugly. There is so much good in franchise. I could stand here and give you stats out the wazoo and turn everyone on, but it's not real. Who are you? What are your skill sets? What brand are you looking at? How does that brand perform? And that's all that matters. you got brands like McDonald's and Wendy's and Dunkin' that have thousands of units. They don't have failures. So you could go give all these great industry stats. 90% of franchises succeed. Awesome. It, it, well, when you start discounting these monster brands with thousands and thousands of units that just don't have failures, don't allow for failures. It's going to go skew those numbers. So again, so much of it comes right back to you. What are you looking for? I, I, I love Jersey Mike's as a customer. I don't want to own one. To me, it's a seven-day-a-week retail business with lots of labor and inventory. Seth has years of background and experience in managing this. I don't. <laughs> it, it's not a good fit for me. Phenomenal brand, phenomenal company. I, I, I Wish I had a, I joke, you give me one Dunkin' Donuts, I'm going to be unhappy. You give me five and I'll be very happy. I can't afford one, yet alone five. But but you need the right business for the right skill set. And Seth is so right. I've met these entrepreneurs over the years that make me look like I don't get out of bed in the morning. They're, they're, they're working every hour at a store, saving every penny, buying in for a small percentage of their next store. Ten years later, I connect with the person. They own five store. I'm like, God bless you. Like, I don't have the work ethic to do what you just did. You married this business. You took ownership, and you built something amazing. And that is the good. There's plenty of bad. There's plenty of ugly. But but it, it all starts with you and finding that right fit. And I can't overemphasize that. I know Seth would agree. Putting him in the wrong business with the wrong where he doesn't have the right skills as good of a business entrepreneur as he is, he's going to struggle. You put him in the right businesses, he can make one plus one equal five. You put him in the wrong business, it's hard to make that math work. So that's the first thing I do with clients. We talk about you, your budget, your goals, your skills, your must-haves, your deal breakers. So many people start the conversation with big brands, McDonald's, Wendy's, Dunkin' Donuts, 7-Eleven, And it's because we're familiar. We see them. They're on Main Street. You can't miss them. But the reality, I start talking to buyers, let's build a business model. How many days a week do you want to work? In a perfect world, I'm working five. Awesome. It's not a perfect world. You might have to do six. You might have to put in extra hours. But but I understand you're targeting five days. What is your budget? Well, I don't want to spend more than 100 grand. Awesome. That's a great budget. But let's take Dunkin' Donuts off the list. We're not getting into Dunkin' Donuts with 100 grand. Uh, budget, whether you're going to go to a bank and try and leverage it or you you, you need more assets. But there are plenty of businesses you can find for that that are five days a week. What else are you looking for? Well, I like sales and marketing. I don't want to build a big team of employees. Awesome. Let's go find a business that costs under a hundred grand. That's five days a week. That doesn't have a lot of labor. And, And this is what we call building a business model. Once we have a business model, we can match it to a franchise. 
I'm involved in a resale right now of an employment service franchise. Helped the person get into it 10 years ago. It's a service business, a desk, a telephone, a computer. He needed a ton of human capital. He needs the right ability to manage an offer say, and sell and market and grow a team. But we are now selling his business, doing over $6 million in revenue. He's earning about a half a million to the bottom line. And, and the dollars he spent to get in versus what he's selling for, that is the good in franchise. There is the ugly. I have helped people get into franchises, and, and I want to cry for them. They built out their store, and they can't get a CO. It's like I want to scream. Every politician, we're here to support the business community. We love entrepreneurs. We're here for business owners. Then why can't I open my store? <laughs> like, I have it built out. I'm ready to go. You're telling me because I need a third water fountain? It, 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 like, I have two yeah, water fountains already. Talking about, I, right? I need a third? We had someone, the, the, the town wanted a grease trap. He's like, you understand, I'm a self-serve yogurt store and I don't use grease. We, we don't care. Great, I'll put a grease trap under the sink. No, we need an in-ground one tied into the septic system. Right. And, and we have to tear up the whole parking lot. It's like, what are we talking about? It, so that is the bad. And I don't know if that's bad on franchising, bad on Nassau County, just bad in business and regulation. But those are things to consider. It, 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 Seth is in a lucky place where he has other businesses and could sort of survive a storm. Imagine he put all into one business and is waiting months and months and months with a built out store to, to get open. So those are the nightmares. And we try very hard to avoid those nightmares, but they exist. And any buyer buying a business, you should have your eyes completely wide open. And I don't want to focus too much but on the negative, there's plenty of it. And buyer beware. And when we go through the process, it's all about these ambushes. But but on the flip side, we are changing people's lives. Franchising changes people's lives. People that, that have mediocre. I think a good franchisor takes somebody with average skill sets and helps them have extraordinary results. And, and you need to validate that. Like Seth said, you could speak to somebody that is doing poor in business, maybe they're a poor operator. Maybe they don't care about cleanliness and training and this and that. I'm not blaming the franchisor, or maybe I am. They should have validated and vetted them out better and found somebody more committed. But but this is related to the franchisee. You want to speak to enough franchisees in your due diligence to understand, I call it the common denominator, who is good and why, who is average and why, who is struggling and why. And, and, and I think if you speak to again, someone in a sign shop, you're going to find the successful people are just natural business networkers. They love business development. They're in community clubs and the Rotary Club. They're, they're, they're out there. It, it's not that they chose the right real estate. Seth's business, he needs to find that right real estate. You open up a sign shop, you could be in an industrial park. You need the right human capital to go build that business. So every business has different components that, that are going to make an owner successful. And, and, and I love the cleaning service franchise. I saw on one of the uh, uh, clean to perfection. If you're not great at managing employees, don't buy a cleaning service franchise. I love so many things about it. Five, uh, typically, I think of it as a five-day week business, recurring revenue, predictability, low, low inventory. But if you are not truly skilled at managing Large teams of low-skilled employees do not own a cleaning service franchise. So like 10 things on my checklist on what I want for a business. It probably has nine of the 10. Recurring revenue, predictability, you know, but I get down to that labor and I got to scratch it off because it doesn't fit my skill set. So again, that is, I could spend hours and hours on it, but to me, there's so many great franchises as long as they're great for you. As great as Jersey Mike's is, as much as it's probably one of my favorite uh, food service restaurants, uh, it's not right for me to own. I am a much better customer at Jersey Mike's than I would be on the other side, dealing with multiple units and multiple landlords. Seth has that skill set. I don't. Give me a microphone and a computer and audience. I love to talk. My wife would have nightmares about giving a presentation, and I'd put her into a cleaning service tomorrow. She, she's bilingual. She can manage employees. So, again, it's not that one brand is good. Is it good for you? Is it right for you? Do you have the right budget? Do you have the right skills? And, and honest to God, I don't want to argue with anything Seth says because I think so highly at the value and everything he's saying, but I do represent franchisors that preach passive investment. I will tell you 90% of them I think are full of it and they're not. But I just did a webinar yesterday with the boutique fitness concept. Passive, they're still telling you, you got to work this thing. You got to manage your managers, but you're not buying a job. You're not instructing classes. 
They, they, they haven't positioned it that you're behind the counter. They need you to go take four or five hours a day to, to look at reports, to drive the market and communicate with your team, but they don't need you on site. So do I think four hours a day is absentee? No. Do I think it's semi-passive, somewhere in between? Again, if you're not the right person with the right skill sets, it makes no difference. You're throwing the money in the garbage. But I do believe there are people that have that skill set that can operate this model that way. I've met restaurant owners that call me to sell their business. They haven't had a day off in 10 years. Then I meet mm -hmm. restaurant owners that tell me they own five different restaurants in four different states and, and have such a great quality of life. So much of it goes right back to you and your skills and what you could do, what you're comfortable letting go of, what you're not comfortable letting go of. And the greatest part about franchising, talking about the good, it, it, it's they've done it many times over. They, they, I'm with Seth. If they don't have 100 units, they're learning. Doesn't mean they're not a good franchise. Doesn't mean you can't get a great opportunity. But your level of risk is increasing tremendously going with the young brand. It, it, again, you get better territory in you know, old Nassau County or what, what, whatever it is. But that's because you're taking that first mover advantage. You want to go buy a brand with hundreds of units. If Depending on who you are, I meet people that come into my office. Stu, why would you show me this brand? They already have 20 locations on Long Island. I want to bring something new here and grow something. Awesome. Let, let's go talk about that. My next meeting, I show somebody new. Why would you show this to me, Stu? I want something really established that already has lots of units here. There, no one is right or wrong. It's their personal comfort level for buying a business and what they're after. And, and, and I like service mm. franchises. I get a pat on the back. I get hand-holding and, and Stu go out and get them. But nobody is micromanaging. I don't need multiple units. I don't need another landlord when I want to grow. I got to sell and market and network and, and, and do lots of different things. But I'm not brick-and-mortar retail-driven. I, I could grow my company January 1st. I give me a pep talk every year. Stu, you're going to make 20 more phone calls a day. You're going to make uh, 100 more letters out every month. You, 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 you're going to go grow your business and have a great year. And I control all that from my desk, my computer. And, and, and Seth wants to grow. He may literally have to say, I think we're going to find another location this year. I think we're ready for a, a, our seventh unit. No right or wrong. There are two different paths, many ways to get to that end zone. So again, that is my point. I, I bring out franchising. I just cover my four myths real quick. Number one, franchising is all about food service. And, and honestly, you got the UPS store. I'm selling uh, cleaning services, employment services. I'm a franchise that sells franchises. Uh, it, 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 it just, the, the, the people that clean the windows at, at, at Seth's store may be a franchise. You have franchises in every different industry. I think most people gravitate towards brick and mortar and retail because we know the brands, we know the names, we know the products. It, it, it's such high visibility. And a lot of people start their search there. But again- if I, if, Stuart, if I could, just one second. Yeah. You know, it, it's also a franchise business. You know, you really got to think about this. You know, a franchise business has certain requirements. So insurance is one of them. So when you go to a, a service industry franchise as a customer, you know that they at least have the minimum insurances they're supposed to have because the franchisor checks that immediately. That's a that's a real checkbox. And when you yeah. uh, invite somebody into your home to steam the carpets, you know, if it's a franchise, uh, you know that they're insured in case there's a problem. You know they have that minimum training. Uh, just you, you, as a consumer, you, you can trust the franchise a little bit more. And, and just to take it to the food service industry, franchise businesses create all the standards. Uh, really, restaurant standards are created at the quick service restaurant level. So there's... Uh, the, the times that people date stamp things and, and check things and all the re food safety requirements that are in the food industry come from the quick service and the, what people, I, I like it to say it's a derogatory term, but the fast food industry, you know. So yes. that restaurant industry provides all of that. And, 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 and you know when you go to eat and they... <laughs> mcdonald's a jersey mike's a dunkin donuts a, a, a any franchise company you know that that owner has insurance people love 
brands. If I needed a painter, I'm probably going with Serta Pro Painters versus Bob's Paint Shop. I have no, and I've been to Serta Pro Painters Discovery Day. They tell you right away, we can't paint any better than anybody else. We, we get the same paints from the same stores. It is not what makes our model special. It's our marketing. It's our owners. We show up on time, our technology, our ability to go give somebody an estimate and give them an estimate on the fly and not wait two days to get back to them. We, we don't give windows. We show up at eight o'clock, not between eight and 7 p.m. Uh, sometime next week. So it, it, again, they're going to tell you, we don't paint any better, but it, it's their standards, their process, their process, their systems. And if I'm selling my home and I don't know a realtor, I'm going to Century 21 versus Bob's Real Estate Service. I have no idea if they're better at Century 20. I just have a comfort level. I had... I'm in another town. I'm hungry. I passed Jersey Mike's or Steve's Deli. I'm going to Jersey Mike's. Steve's Deli might be better. I have no idea. They might be worse. I know what I'm getting at Jersey Mike's. I, I'm thrilled right. to go there. It, 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 it's So again, people love brands. And especially talking about service businesses, brands love brands. I, I, it, it's There's so many fragmented industries. Uh, Jersey Mike's probably wants to deal with one national painter like Serta Pro Painters that have... 800 different owners need to call 800 different painters. Serta Pro has in the system the colors of Jersey Mike's stores, what walls get paint, what way. And they're making Seth's life easier. They, they, they've made their life corporate easier. They've passed along value to me as an owner because there's a company that's doing 800 stores worth of work, potentially not one store. So again, the value... And I had people that look at franchises, Stu. I would never join Jersey Mike's, pay 11% royalty. Awesome, don't. <laughs> no one's begging you to. But if you want hand-holding, if you want to find that right real estate, if you want to, listen, I pick up my dad as an entrepreneur with an auto body shop. He could. He doesn't believe in franchising. He went to the school of hard knocks and, and, and built it all himself. His first location was too small. He had to relocate it. Second location, he had to go buy the building next door because there's no yard for towing. And he thought the money was really in towing. It, eventually, he got it figured out. But he made mistake after mistake after mistake. He overpaid people and had no money. He underpaid people and had turnover. You join a franchise, hopefully, they're going to help you find the right location. They're going to guide you on what you need to pay people. They're going to guide you that if you're planning on growing, you might want a bigger space so you could get towing into this and you don't have to relocate that. It, you, you know, he figured it out one way and I'm blessed. I went to college. I value the education. I don't mind paying my royalty as long as you give me something that works. So I will tell you, I sat down with the company 1-800-GOT-JUNK years ago before they were anything, 16% royalty, explaining to me why I should go give them leads. And I knew nothing at the time. I, I, I'm in franchising for half an hour. And I'm like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You're teaching people how to remove junk for 16%. I, I was so close-minded. The meeting ended, whatever, a year later, they sold out Long Island. I think the guy's crushing it. But, but the point is, now I understand 16% royalty. If you need their service, you call 1-800-GOT-JUNK. They answer the phones. They had tablet technology 20 years ago before anybody else. Their call center is award-winning and gets you referrals because they call the client, they thank them, they ask anyone else. I, I, you couldn't duplicate what they do if you paid 16% of your revenue. So on one end, I don't care paying a 16% royalty because there's value. I, I'm happy. I can make the money I want. There's a return on my investment. I'm comfortable. My father, I'm not paying anybody 1% royalty. Awesome. Don't. It, it, it's And I wouldn't pay 4% on the next brand if they can't answer the question. What am I getting in return? Why should I be? We were selling self-serving yogurt franchises. Why are you better? We play better music at our store. I'm like, this is the whole competitive advantage that we're approaching with. It, it, like, doesn't mean some people didn't get into it and make great money and have great locations. But to me, that's as much luck as anything else. You're buying a franchise because it's proven over and over and over again. Systems, processes, and like Seth, Seth said, due diligence is everything. Good, bad, ugly. You have such an opportunity to reduce the ugly if you are smart about your homework and research. 
And, and listen, I'm a business broker. I sell established companies. First thing you're doing is signing a confidentiality that you're not talking to anybody. Second thing, you can't talk to the employees. Third, it, it, it's You have such limitations. Hey, buy this bagel store doing a million dollars in revenue, earning 200 grand, but I'm going to give you tax returns that say it's doing 500 and making 20 grand. It, it, it really is doing the million earning 200. The tax returns are terrible. As Seth pointed, this owner robbed himself, kept the cash. Now he wants to go sell. He shot himself in the foot. To me, it's still a great sellable business. I got a bagel store doing a million, earning 200. I just can't get him paid the way I would have if he ran it professionally. And, and like I said, buyer beware. You signed a confidentiality agreement. You can't talk to the employees. I got tax returns that don't match up. It, 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 it's I'm going to tell you to hang out in front of this store and count customers. It, it, like it, it, It's hard to do that due diligence so accurately. You go, I want to go join Jersey Mike's. I promise you, by the time, if I'm approved and I make sense to them, by the time I am ready, I've spoken to a dozen owners. I've built P&Ls. I've heard from Seth and what his gross margins are. I've spoken to other owners. I understand what it takes to be successful. I'm not confused that I'm going to go build this and Jersey Mike's flag is just going to carry me to success. They're going to give me their half of the package. I got to go deliver on the other half. So again, there's good, bad, ugly. And if I could bring home one point, you can minimize the ugly. You really can, but that's on you and homework and research and due diligence and connected with Ronnie and Seth and Stu and 50 million other great professionals out there in the franchising world that want you to find success. And I will tell you, and Seth will tell you, good franchisors award franchises. If you ever feel you are being sold a franchise, run for the hills because you are. I, I, I have a candidate who's upset with me. Stu, I want to buy into this franchise and the franchisor wants me to take a personality profile to see how I match to their better owners. This is ridiculous. This is my money. If I'm buying it, I'm like, you sound like a moron. They know who was successful in their <laughs> business and, and they want to help you decide if you really have similar personality character. I love this franchise. I want to put them on a pedestal and tell, tell more people about them. Don't buy because they want to understand who's coming into their system. That is a great franchisor. It, it, the, the franchisor that says, I don't care. You can pay the franchise fee. You come on in, go run for the hills. But the way you validate this like Seth said, you get their franchise disclosure document, and I'm all over the place. I want to end it for Q&A, but you got to talk to a lot of owners, and, and people in franchising are phenomenal, and they're transparent. You speak to, if Seth bought into Jersey Mike's, and they sold him a bag of goods, and they don't support him, and the food is spoiled, and the vendors are ripping him off, let me go call Seth and say, I'm thinking about joining Jersey Mike's. Are you happy? Are you making money? Would you do it again? I'm pretty sure he's going to say, go run for the hills. It, it, or I'm going to go close to that and say, listen, it is hard work. I'm busting my ass, but they live up on their end of their promises. And I built a successful organization. I, I'm going to be excited. I'm going to be scared of the hard work. And I'm going to go peel that back with 50 more questions. But you want to speak to a lot of owners because if people are happy, they're going to share that. And if they're unhappy, they're either not going to share that and just simply not return your phone calls and have no time for you. Or they're point blank going to just share but, but just because someone's happy or unhappy, you need a good population sample. Me owning a cleaning franchise with lots of those skilled employees, I'm going to be unhappy. Doesn't mean it's a bad brand. I chose the wrong business. It, 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 so you got to connect with enough people to make informed decisions. So, all right. all right. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Seth. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, all of you who came to this workshop. I really appreciate it. Um, that's it. We'll say goodbye for today. Have a wonderful day.